Good morning, church. I'm so excited to be with you on this special Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. Hey, if it's your birthday today, then happy birthday. And by the way, you share your birthday with the birthday of the church. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean Rosebank Union Church. I mean the church. This is the day that we remember that the crucified, risen, ascended, and therefore exalted Jesus gave his Holy Spirit, poured it out on his people and formed them into a beautiful, living, spiritual organism known as the church. And you know, if you think about it, since that day, what, like 2,000 odd years since then, that, that the church has grown, uh, it just I mean, today, I think it's somewhere around two and a half billion people that claim to be Christians worldwide, like from that first group of 120 people. You think about it, it just doesn't make any sense that that little movement grew so massively. I mean, think about it. Uh, here's a group of guys whose founder... Uh, was killed and mysteriously resurrected and ascended. So who left them, this group of, I don't know, 120 people who were not exactly the most influential people in society. Uh, uh, think about this movement. I mean, there was no uh, kind of material gains to be had uh, from this. This was a group of people who were known for their sacrifice, uh, for how they suffered and endured their immense generosity. Like there was no material wealth to be gained. It just does not make sense that the Christian church grew like it did. And in fact, there's a professor at Yale. Uh, his name was Kenneth uh, Latourette. He said this. He said, the more one examines the various factors which seem to account for the extraordinary victory of Christianity, the more one is driven to search for a cause underlying them all. It is clear that at the very beginning of Christianity, there must have occurred a vast release of energy virtually unequaled in history. Nothing else could explain the surge of the early Christian movement. Now, what caused this release of energy lies outside the realm in which modern historians are supposed to move. Exactly. Right? It's outside the realm of historians. It's outside the realm of scientists. It's outside the realm of sociologists. It just does not make sense except in the realm of the kingdom of God. It could only have happened because God himself gave himself to build his kingdom. And here's the thing. God is still giving himself right now to build his kingdom. I mean, listen, the Holy Spirit is not going to come again because he's already here. But what the Spirit did on that day of Pentecost, he has continued to do every year, every generation since then in empowering, in lighting the flame of the church of Jesus Christ which is just such good news for us and such good news for me as, as we think about church because so much is changing and changing so drastically and so quickly. I mean, think about us as a church, just how we've had to like scramble to adjust to all that's happening around us and bring everything online. And here we are today on, on Pentecost Sunday. We're launching church at home 3.0. Uh, I'm sitting in the room with these guys, the team that has put together this amazing studio, uh, kind of poured so much into this, this moment. And just this week now is another announcement of something that we've now got to consider in the gathering of people of the church. And what does that mean? And I'm going to tell you, at this point, we don't know what that means. And, and we're going to take a lot of time to really think and pray about it and figure out what's the best thing. But you know, in all this uncertainty, in this unpredictability, one thing I've come to realize is that never before have we as a church, have I been in such circumstances that are more like what these early disciples were in. It's just so unpredictable. There they were. 
they didn't know what was happening. They were just waiting for this moment that Jesus had promised. And they knew that he was going to empower them to build his kingdom. But they didn't know what was coming. They didn't know what to do. You know, I think for myself, I rely so much on plans and, and getting things going. And these days, I mean, just what do we do? I was, I was on a call uh, just a couple of days ago with a, a contact from mine passed in the States, you know, and, they, and they're a little bit ahead. They're going through these exact same things. And uh, his comment to me was this. He said, he said, Richard, never before in all my years of ministry have I gone through something where I could not pick up the phone and call somebody. He's like, I don't have anyone to call. There's, there's nobody who knows exactly what to do in this time. And so it just makes me think, hey, like never before do we have an opportunity as a church to enter into this. We were in the same space as these disciples who were there waiting, praying and just expecting God to lead them and use them. And so I really I want to actually pause right now in the sermon. This will be a little, this will be a little different. I want to pause and pray just for us as a church, because this is what God did with his early church. He sent his spirit and empowered them, gave them everything they needed to build his kingdom. And I really feel like we, we need that right now. And so let's, let's pray. Hey, this is not the last prayer, so don't go be making your lunch already, right? So let's, let's pray and let's ask God to lead us. Lord Jesus Christ, we just remember today that this was the day where, where you sent your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we, we come before you in humble dependence and pray that you would fill us, empower us, envision us, lead us, give us wisdom, do everything that you did with that early group that catapulted your church and pour that out on Rosebank Union Church. That we could see your kingdom expand in Joburg. Amen. After they prayed, the Holy Spirit came and filled them. And it was this amazing moment. You read that story in Acts 2. It's all kind of crazy. And it, it, I don't think that that's going to happen for us like it did then, because that was the first time that the Holy Spirit was coming upon them. But He will still fill us. The experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit is an experience that every Christian can expect to have at multiple times in their Christian lives. Like much like these disciples experience, something we can expect to happen at various times. And I could only describe this filling of the Spirit as God making himself known to us in a felt, powerful way. And so sometimes when God just makes his presence known in a really intimate way, so sometimes that will be a moment of knowing his love for you in a way that is so powerful and so felt that it just drives away all of your insecurities. Sometimes God making himself known to you is more like him gently but firmly pointing out areas of brokenness in your life. Sometimes his making himself known is like God, a sense of his putting his arm around you and just stilling your state of distress. Sometimes it can be this urge, this feeling compelled to somehow be used in his kingdom. I'll never forget the day I was on like this Christian youth camp and in a space of worship. And let me tell you, the song that we were singing was just this crazy reggae type song. It was just, it was silly. Uh, we were singing the song. It was this moment in, in, in the lyric that was this um, sense of Jesus outstretched arms. All I remember about the song is this line, Jesus outstretched arms. And I can't explain it, but it was the sense of it just that was very, very real. And it just catapulted me into this life of ministry that I'm in right now. That's what, that's all of those kinds of things and more is this idea of 
of being filled of the Holy Spirit coming upon us. It's God making himself known to you in a felt, powerful, personal, intimate way. Now listen, when you become a Christian, so that moment when you first realized that Jesus is Savior, in that moment, the Bible tells us, Ephesians chapter 1, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And as Justin spoke about in his introduction, that sealing of the Holy Spirit is kind of like that ring. It's that, that covenant symbol. It is God's sign of his ownership of you. It's a symbol of his protection. It's kind of like at that moment when you're sealed with the Spirit, a little light is switched on inside of you and that little light will never go off. That's what it means to be sealed with the Spirit at the moment you believe, at the moment you become a Christian. But there are moments subsequent to that as a Christian when it's almost like that God just opens the grid and the electricity opens and that little light starts to shine a lot brighter. I'll never forget this illustration I heard once. It was so helpful to me about this. So when I was younger, we used to go camping a lot. And so you have the kind of caravan park. You know, you have these bathrooms. You go shower at night, these communal bathrooms. And so you kind of head to the showers. And I don't know if you've seen these pretty old. I don't know if they have them still these days. But you walk into your shower and there's that geezer, right? That box. And inside that little box is that little gas flame, right? It's a little blue gas flame. And that flame is always on. It's like a tiny little valve and it's open just a little bit so that that little light is burning like 24 7. And when you come to take your shower and when you open the hot tap that opens up this gas valve and then you, you hear that sound like woof and that little blue light goes poof into this big flame and that's what kind of heats up your water and then you turn off the tap and then it comes down and it's back to the little blue pilot light. That little blue pilot light is what, it means, is, is what it means to be sealed with the Spirit. It's the deposit. It's the guarantee of our inheritance. It never goes out. Despite the darkness you may feel is in you, despite the darkness you may feel is around you, that light never goes out. But there are moments in your life as a Christian when God himself reaches down and he opens up that hot tap and that little pilot light just bursts into flame. And it brings warmth and light and burns away all of those things. That's what happened on Pentecost Sunday is God opened up the valve and the church was set alight. That's all these pictures of tongues and of fire. It's this image of God just opening up, filling his disciples with the Holy Spirit. And that's what he still does with us today. And so after this happens... Um, Peter gets outside, this whole crowd is gathered because of all these crazy things going on. And Peter preaches the very first sermon in the history of the church. And actually today what I wanted to look at is this first sermon of Peter. And all we're going to get to today is just the first part. And to, next week we'll have a look at, at the rest of the sermon. So read with me. We're in Acts chapter 2 and reading from verse 14 to 21. But Peter standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, the crowd. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, the disciples, because there was all this crazy things going on. They are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this that is happening is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In verse 17, is the quote from Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great and magnificent day and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in the very first sermon 
in the history of the church, Peter quotes the prophet Joel, which makes a lot of sense because what he's doing is he's explaining what was happening around them. But he's explaining the disciples suddenly speaking in all kinds of languages. And he's saying this is what was predicted by the prophet Joel. And when the Holy Spirit comes, Joel said, people will be so filled with the knowledge of God that they will spontaneously, naturally, and enthusiastically just speak about God and all that he has done. That's what it means. And they shall prophesy. It's not about predicting the future. There's nothing remarkably holy about being able to predict the future. God's not interested in that. It's about this natural, spontaneous, exuberant speaking and praise for what God has done. And let me tell you this. I want that in my life. I want God to kind of open that up within me, this natural, enthusiastic, just speaking about Him and all that He's done. I mean, I, I mean, it's easy for me on a Sunday, and I love to do that on a Sunday. But like during the week, you know, when, around my neighbors and in my neighborhood then, and outside, like I would love for that to be a reality in my own life. And wouldn't you? Like as we've prayed already for the church to be catapulted, for its flame to be lit, like part of that is individual Christians being set on fire just naturally, enthusiastically talking about Jesus. Do you want that? So, hey, let's do this again. Let's pause for a second and let's pray for that. I want that. And if you want that, then let's pause and pray, Lord Jesus. It's our desire as a church. You light our flame. But not just as this corporate Rosebank Union church, but as individual Christians. God, I ask that you open that up in my life. This natural, spontaneous, enthusiastic ability to speak about you in ways that are transformative to those who are listening. Holy Spirit, would you do that? May we be changed even from this moment. Amen. So he's quoting Joel, Peter, because he wants to explain all that's happening around him. So it's a good choice, Joel, but it's also a pretty awkward choice. So I think it's almost like that moment when a preacher uses a very awkward illustration. Kind of like you say this whole thing and it just there's awkward silence. I'm pretty sure that's happened with me already and you guys. So, so here's why. So he's quoting Joel. And if you've ever read the book of Joel, you know, the occasion of Joel's prophecy was a massive devastation caused by a plague of locusts, right? It was a very real historical event where this plague of locusts decimated, right, the crops of Israel at the time. And on top of that, there came a drought, right? So they couldn't even recover. And so Israel's in this place of just the economy has been decimated. There's no chance of them coming back from that. I mean, think about just right now and this e the economy and like this V-shape, U-shape. I mean, they were like, we, no, there's no return here. I mean, it was a, just an occasion of utter national, natural disaster. And so Peter quotes Joel, uh, which is this vivid picture of locusts destroying a harvest on the day of Pentecost, which, by the way, was a day, a feast that specifically celebrated the harvest. Which to me is like almost like that's, that's a little bit awkward. Like it, and, and guys listening would have remembered this. They would know this about the prophet Joel. And so Peter mentions this because Joel's prophecy was a reminder to the Israelites that the, these natural circumstances, this disaster around them was meant to be a warning. A warning of a future, final, eternally devastating judgment that would come upon them. That's what the day of the Lord means in verse 20. Right, the prophet Joel, the day of the Lord. And I could speak like for days about the day of the Lord, but it, it simply means this. The day when Jesus Christ will come back 
and sort everything out. Like he's going to deal with evil and deal with sin once and forever. That's the day of the Lord. And Joel was warning them, this, these circumstances, this disaster around you is a warning to you of a future, final, eternally devastating judgment. Which is really, it's heavy, right? Yeah, it is. And then that last line of Joel, this is where Peter ends his quote from Joel, that last line. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved in that day. So, so Peter masterfully brings up this Old Testament passage that reverberates with the theme of God's judgment and that day of the Lord. But then he, he's careful to add that part about that judgment can be avoided by calling on the name of the Lord. And then, and this is the most important part, then he makes that very specific in the rest of his speech. What he says is that this Jesus, this Jesus who you saw walking around doing all these signs and wonders, who you crucified, doesn't pull any punches, this Jesus, who God was attesting with signs and wonders, you crucified, who is now risen, and ascended and seated at the right hand of God, therefore exalted, this Jesus is the Lord. So calling on the name of the Lord is calling on the name of Jesus. That's how you'll be saved. Through this man, Jesus. who You've just seen all do all of these amazing things. And you can pick, pick that up in what he's, as he's trying to argue this in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God, right? This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him, but God raised him up. And then he goes on to quote a Psalm 16, which was this prediction by David that the Messiah would not stay dead, that he would be resurrected. And then he carries on to say in verse 32, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you selves are seeing and hearing. For David did not descend, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Him Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Well, that, that's, that's Peter's speech. And this, all that you're seeing around you, no, this is what Joel predicted would happen. This natural utterances of what God has done. But remember, Joel warned of a terrific day of judgment. But Joel also told us of how that judgment would be avoided by calling on the name of the Lord. And Peter's saying, hey, that name of the Lord is the name of this man, Jesus. Crucified, risen, ascended, exalted, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And by the way, the right hand of the throne of God, just think about it. We talk about our right hand man. That's the place where God exercises his rule. And Jesus is therefore the one who's Lord, his king, exercising his rule over earth. And the way that he's exercising his rule, just listen, get this. The way that he's exercising his rule is by giving the Holy Spirit, dispensing it to his church, to empower his church, to build his kingdom and expand his rule and his reign here on earth. You know, that last line, verse 36 that I read, it's, pretty, it's the summary of Peter's sermon. So, let everyone know for certain that this Jesus is both Lord and Christ. He's King and Savior. So, best you submit to him, Peter says. And boy, I mean, they got it. 
You just read the response of the guys listening to Peter's sermon, verse 37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? So now we sit here today, 31st of May, 2,000 years later. And let me ask you this, um, Joel in chapter 1, when, when he is talking about this devastating national natural disaster, Joel says, has anything like this ever happened before? Just think about the times we're living in now. How does that sound as a phrase to sum up? Has anything like this ever happened before? And the message that we need to hear is that it is a reminder, a warning, how broken the world is and how broken we are and how powerless we are to do anything about it, the brokenness around us and do anything about the brokenness inside of us. Now listen, just hear me straight. I'm not saying that God made this virus and that it is His judgment on the world. What I am saying is we've wasted this crisis if it has not reminded us of our utter dependency on the grace and love of God. I mean, let me tell you, it's a, a waste. Everything we've been through, all the struggle and lockdown and all the anxiety and all the frustration has been a complete and utter waste. If not at the end of it, we do not come out with an increased sense of depending on, relying on, asking for, the empowering, filling love of God through His Holy Spirit. So you might be saying, so, so brothers, sisters, what shall we do? Well, we're going to do what the people listening to Peter's sermon did. And so let's get into a moment of prayer. This is the last prayer now, so... As, you're, as your eyes are closed and wherever you are in your, in your homes or on your own or gathered with, with your family, Peter's response to what shall we do is one word, repent. And repentance is, it's more than asking forgiveness for sins. It's not less than that, but it is more than that. Repentance is not bringing before God all of our micro brokenness. It's acknowledging a pattern of brokenness. It's acknowledging the direction that we've been walking has been just completely wrong and is leading to destruction and realizing that the way of Jesus is the way that leads to life, that leads to freedom, that leads to this kind of life of living near to God. That's repentance. It's just this deep knowledge. I've been sold a pack of lies about life in the world and now I realize the truth. And at the heart is this response of calling on the name of Jesus. And so church, I just want to ask you, I mean, where you are, I don't want to tell you how you should pray right now. I'm not a big fan of giving you words in this moment. I believe this is a moment for us to sit quietly and to allow the Holy Spirit to move, to speak, to fill us. He does this work best. Your response is a, whatever it means to you to cry out, to call on the name of the Lord, to ask for His mercy, to thank God. 
I don't want to give you the words, but just to encourage you to just have some moment of silence. And in your heart or out loud, if you're on your own or if you're comfortable, acknowledge Jesus, Lord and Saviour, King and Christ. Maybe you've confessed him as king before, but really you've just been living your own way. And the Holy Spirit is convicting and moving you. Perhaps there's things he's asked you to do and you've just completely rebelled against that or stubbornly refused or put it away. Or maybe you've acknowledged him as savior, you've called yourself a Christian, but you still live in such deep guilt and shame. Or in anxiety of trying to earn God's favor. And you need the assurance that that's the positive the Holy Spirit gives. Jesus, we come before you on this day. And together as a church scattered around the city, acknowledge and declare you are our Lord, our King. We submit to you. We bow before you. Lead us. And you are our Savior. Through you, We've avoided disaster. Out of your great love and mercy. And we thank you and we love you. Amen.